We're speaking with Steve Jordans, a psychology professor at the University of Toronto. Steve, thank you so much for uh, lending some of your time to share your insights on mental health uh, with us here in Dauphin, Manitoba. Oh, great to be with you, Matt. Uh, I understand that uh, this COVID situation, we know adding a great deal of stress to our lives. I think we're all kind of coming along in our awareness of just what kind of impact this can have on our mental health. Uh, Where do we begin to kind of sort through all the stressors, everything that's unfolding in front of us? Um, From your perspective, where's a good place to start in terms of taking inventory and arriving at a, uh, maybe a healthier mental state? Yeah. Um, cool. Good question. The, the, the first place I would start is understanding, um, just knowledge, uh, getting a sense of what is this anxiety response? You know, why, why does our body respond the way it does and, and how does that then involve our mind in all these anxious thoughts? Because it's actually a pretty, you know, basic primitive reflex that we have that, uh, and, and it's meant to be, you know, we're out gathering berries and, and then suddenly a predator emerges in front of us and we have a threat to our existence and the system kicks in that makes us ready to either fight that fl- uh, predator or flee from it. So it fills us with all this energy, all this strength and this sort of cognitive desire to do something about the situation. We become sort of more emotional and less rational. It's kind of like no time for thought. This is a time for action. Uh, and it's meant to be a situation where we take out that predator or get away from it, and then one way or another, a half an hour later, it's all over. Um, the problem we have here is the predator is just hanging around, and we're staring at it every day. And this response, which is meant to be just a quick, acute response, is becoming chronic. And so, you know, I think the first the first place to start is to really kind of understand what that is. There's no fancy mojo. This is no baggage from well, it is baggage from your past, from your evolutionary past, I guess. It's just a very basic biological response. And once you understand understand it, then you can recognize it when it's happening to you, when when your anxiety is pretty high. You can go, oh, okay, yeah, I recognize what that feels like now. And and that's the first step towards actually doing something about it in terms of managing the, the feelings you're having. That is such an interesting way to look at it. Almost the uh, stress response, this anxiety, uh, really, yeah, like an evolutionary response. Uh-huh. And so to look at it like that, maybe that can help us going forward. I didn't, you know, maybe not attach ourselves too much to this undesirable uh, mental health uh, state that's arising from what's happening, uh, what we're seeing. So, well, where do we go from there? We, we know kind of it's eliciting these behaviors. Uh, definitely in the world of coping and managing, there's maybe some positive ways and maybe some more negative ways. Can you touch on what the research, what maybe you've been keeping an eye on in terms of effective and maybe not so effective coping strategies? Yeah, there's sort of two classes of of way you can go. And and one is something we would call a skill-based approach, which is going to take a lot of time, well, a bit of time, a bit of effort, but it's going to leave you with a skill that you can use the rest of your life. And and that skill specifically is the ability to kind of summon relaxation over your entire body. Relaxation is literally on a biological level sort of the opposite of that response I just described to you. It's like everything like for example when we're in the fight and flee our heart is beating very fast but when we're in the relax mode it's slow Similarly, you know, our breathing is fast when it's fight or flee, and it's slow when we're relaxed. So everything is literally the opposite. So the best sort of really powerful way to learn to manage your anxiety is to learn how to summon this this relaxation response and kind of push the anxiety literally out of your body. It, again, takes time. Um, There are things called guided relaxation audios that people would need to listen to a few times because the first step is to really... Um, get a clear sense of what that means to feel relaxed and so to really learn and own that feeling and once you really know it then you get the ability to kind of command it uh, and so that's a really powerful thing and I kind of wish we were teaching our kids this I, I would love to see it almost part of our curriculum right now because it could get them through COVID and it could get them through life beyond so that's a real sort of long-term strategy um, there's also some really sort of quick fix short-term strategies and they all kind of boil down to the same thing but like you say some some are negative and some are positive and what they boil down to is becoming more mindful of the effect that certain activities that we do have on our mental state so for example watching the news 
um, when you're watching the news, we're all, you know, very tempted to watch the news and see the latest numbers and find out what the positivity rate is. Information kind of makes us feel like we, we at least know what's going on. Uh, but it's also like staring that predator right in the face. And, and if you're going to stare the predator in the face, you're going to get that anxiety response. And if that becomes something you do too often during the day, you're going to continually be feeding that response. Uh, and so what you need to do is, is find some other kind of realize, and often it is realization. Um, we may already have some, some things in our lives. So the, the one I often mention is I learned how to use GarageBand over, over this COVID period, which is this thing that allows me to get songs that have been rattling around my head actually out. And so I can turn them into actually real songs. And when I do that, COVID is gone. Um, my, my head for that hour that I'm in the basement playing with this stuff is totally into the music. We all have something like that, something that takes our mind to a better place, to a non-COVID place. And if we kind of inspect our lives a little bit and find that thing, that thing is medicine. Um, that, that thing is an opportunity. It's a way to change the channel of our, of our mind. Uh, so that literally, if we feel like anxious thoughts are starting to get the best of us, maybe we just watch the news, then those are sort of behaviors that, that can really kind of give us a break. And in fact, sort of a, a sort of final thought on this, some behaviors have a real extra mojo in the sense that they release hormones that counter the stress hormone. Cortisol is the stress hormone. And things like singing dancing, aerobic activity, laughing with other people, those sorts of behaviors um, can actually release endorphins, which counter the negative effects of stress. And so if you can, you know, do karaoke with your kids, all of our smartphones have karaoke or our smart TVs have karaoke built into them. Things like that, where if you end up laughing and singing, that is also, you know, real good medicine. And so almost scheduling things like that in our day to kind of give us a break and, and to give us some positivity to go along with all this great cloud. We're speaking with Steve Jordans, a psychology professor at the University of Toronto. Steve, I think you highlighted some really uh, cool strategy there, which is to, to find something of some kind of personal significance that we can really dive into almost and escape uh, a pretty you know, valuable coping mechanism if we can identify those things that uh, can provide that for us that are that yep. meaningful. Now, beyond those personal things that we can dive into, uh, my final question will be this. What can we do in terms of we've kind of been deprived of our ability to connect, whether it's going out to music yeah. shows, having that group experience, yeah. uh, what we have our Zoom or online, but how are we to replace, you know, the fundamental need of person-to-person uh, -person interaction? Yeah, and, and it is fundamental. I mean, literally, like no other animal, we need other human beings from the moment of birth and, you know, up to, depending on who you ask, 30 years of life or, or something like that before they leave the house. Um, and so that social connection is, is really, really strong, uh, or that social need is really, really strong. And when we had the COVID thing and we heard of social distancing, you know, my first reaction was, no, no, this is when we need our social networks. What we need is physical distancing. We need social, if anything, enhancement enhancement, more social connectivity. So we have to do it differently. You know, we, we all know the Zoom story. We all know whatever. My preference is the phone. Uh, when people speak on with each other in the phone, they really attend to one another. And there's sort of two clear signals of information. There's the words you're saying. That's the less relevant, it turns out. And then there's all of these sort of non-verbals, the, the tone you use, the way you grunt or sigh or laugh or chuckle when somebody says something, all of those sounds tell that other person you're listening and you care. Uh, and, and that's what we really need from our phone conversation. So I suggest to people, like, get some buddies that you watch a show with. doesn't matter, you know, Mass Singer, whatever it is you're into. And then schedule some time to connect with them on the phone and say, what do you think of that show? And, you know, any excuse to talk um, at all. But schedule that and, and see the value of that in that medicinal way as well. That it's, you know, a chance for you to reaffirm your connections with others and to feel all those people that, that care and that are sharing that same experience that is you know the the image that i often have in mind is the young children who who go off on some adventure um but when they're going off on an adventure and something scary happens they go running back to their mother's leg or their mother's lap um that mother's leg or mother's lap that's our go-to when we get scared and and we need that now and and it's a very powerful 
a grounding kind of tool for us. And so if anything, you know, this is a great chance to reach out to those family members that have maybe drifted a little or or those close friends that you'd wished you kept better contact with. Great chance to sort of reinitiate that and, and use that for them and for you. Steve, on behalf of the Parkland region here in Manitoba, I want to thank you for your time and uh, very kind of you to take time out of your busy schedule to share some insights and very valuable, you know, jumping off points for us to get a better uh, relationship with our overall well-being, specifically mental health. So uh, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. I've been to Manitoba a few times. I love it. Beautiful province. So, yeah, I wish the best to all of you out there.